Good morning. Welcome to worship with Centennial United Methodist Church at Ivy. I'm Pastor Danny, and I'm so grateful that you're taking the time out of your um, week to worship with us here at Centennial. We have a few announcements for you today. The best way to stay updated with all the changes and everything that's going on is to visit our website, ibcentennial.org. You can also find our bulletin for this morning's worship service on our website under the sermon videos tab. Um, some of the things that we do, we have different things going on each day. So on Tuesdays, we have this thing on our website and our Facebook page called Tell a Friend Tuesday, where you can just tell your friends at Ivy what you've been up to. You can also check out what others at Ivy are up to, what books they're reading, what recipes they're trying. So if you have anything you want to submit, send it to me by text message or on Facebook, or you can send it to my email, pastordannym at gmail.com. Um, on Wednesdays, we have worship, and last week we had our first youth uh, meeting on Zoom, so we'll have another one of those this Wednesday at 6 p.m., and then um, and then we'll have our worship at 7 p.m. On Thursdays, we do bedtime stories, so if you have a bedtime story you want to read and video, send it on my way. Otherwise, you can see another one <laughs> read by me, and then... Um, you can, you know, see all of these links and all that we're up to each week on our website or on our Facebook page. So be sure to check those out. This Monday evening, tomorrow evening at 7 p.m., we'll have another Zoom leadership meeting. It's with most of our committee chairs. So we'll have that meeting Monday at 7 p.m. over Zoom to discuss what we're going to do for the month of May. And then today at 12 o'clock noon, we will have another communion live service on YouTube. So you can find the link for that on our website and on our Facebook page. I hope it works well, and I hope that you'll join us to bring your own elements of bread. And if you have juice or wine, bring that as well. And we will partake in the Holy Supper together. So if you'll join me in listening to our centering moment, our centering quote, it allows us to just take a deep breath in as we reflect on the reason that we come to worship today. And that reason is like, um, is the same reason that we come to worship every time. That's to worship God. Um, so I hope that this centering quote kind of helps us think a little bit more about what we're going to reflect on today, particularly around the topic and theme of rest. And um, I hope it centers us all as we come to worship. Hear this quote now from Wayne Moeller. The word humility, like the word human, comes from hummus or earth. We are most human when we do no great things. We are not so important. We are simply dust and spirit at best. We're loving midwives, participants in a process much larger than we. But in the end, we are granted the tremendous blessing of knowing that we do very little at all by ourselves. Amen. If you'll join me in the call to worship, and please say it out loud with me now. In the midst of darkness and chaos, God imagined. In the fury and darkness, God imagined a world filled with trees and blue skies and fluffy white clouds. In the meadow, God stood and imagined foxes, bluebirds, and slithering snakes. In a world of rainstorms and wildlife, God imagined humanity. In a world full of billions of people, God imagined me. God imagined you and God imagined me. God imagined us all. God loves each of us. So let us worship with the same imagination as the creating one. Amen. Last weekend we had Allison and Evan 
Allison Lane, Evan Fisher, and Eric Hall, and Linda Carnahan, they came to the church. We practiced great social distancing, and we recorded some new hymns. So right now, um, I invite you to sing along with them in this hymn. This is the time in our worship service when we lift up the prayers of all of us here in our community. We have quite a few prayers um, that I'll lift up. Many of them we've been praying for for a while now, and some um, are new prayers. So I want to lift up these prayers for us and list them out so that you can hold them in your prayers as well this week. We ask for prayers for Nancy Dorrell, her family and medical staff. She has suffered with breast cancer for a long time, and she is the sister of Ed Myers. We continue to ask for prayers for Kathy Johnston, who uh, was recently diagnosed with cancer and has been going through chemo the last few weeks. We ask for prayers for Jim Denhart as he continues to recover from a recent outpatient surgery, and we ask for prayers for both him and for Rita and we give immense thanks that this week he had scans that came out um, letting us know that he is still cancer free and we thank God for that. We ask for prayers for the family and friends of Joanne Fisher who died recently. Joanne is a family friend of Maggie Stout. We continue to pray for the family of Ruth Marks who died this month. Ruth is the aunt of Joy Warner, Jeff Friel, Jennifer Fisher, and Jill Craven. We pray for all of their families. We continue to pray for Bill Cotton. He was one of Centennial's past, Centennial United Methodist Church at Ivy's Pastors. And he moved to Wesley Acres recently with health problems, so we keep him and his family in our prayers. We ask for prayers for Dan Gracie, who has been diagnosed recently with prostate cancer. Dan is the son-in-law of Ken and Deb Pickering, and so we offer prayers for their whole family, including Dan's wife, Diane. We ask for prayers for Trish Lowe, who is a woman in Black Hawk County. She has experienced symptoms of COVID-19. While her test turned out negative, and we give thanks for that, we also ask for prayers for her husband, Luke, whose test came out positive. We continue to pray for Alice, who is a four-year-old battling cancer. We give thanks that she has been feeling well recently while she waits for a new date for surgery. We continue to ask for prayers for Brooke Person, who had surgery last week on her ankle and continues to recover. We continue to pray for a sixth grader in our community who is undergoing cancer treatments. We pray for Marty Martin, who continues to recover from his long hospital stay and his leg amputation. We pray for Leanne Martin, who heard from her work that one of her co-workers had been exposed to COVID, and so we just pray for all those who work with Leanne and for Leanne and her family, 
as she works on continuing to keep herself and her family healthy. We ask for prayers for the family of Larry Heberlin, who has been in hospice care. Larry and his wife, Karen, attended Centennial a few years ago, and so we ask for prayers for Larry in his, in his smooth transition and for his family and his friends. And of course, we continue to lift up all the people around the world who have been affected by COVID for those who um, are experiencing symptoms, for those who are being treated by the virus, for all of our healthcare centers and the workers there who are trying to stay healthy, for people losing their jobs, for all those who are working in public, for them to stay safe, for students and teachers who grieve that they cannot be together, for parents who are figuring out their new normal with their children at home while they work from home. We just keep all of these people in our prayers every day during this pandemic. So will you join me now in a moment of prayer? Oh God, we thank you for this earth, our home, for the wide sky and the blessed sun, for the oceans and streams, for the towering hills and the whispering wind, for the trees and the green grass. We thank you for our senses by which we hear the songs of birds and see the splendor of fields of golden wheat and taste autumn's fruit, rejoice in the feel of snow and smell the breath of spring flowers. God, grant us a heart opened wide to all of this, your beauty. Even in the midst of all that we give thanks for around your creation, God, we still grieve the reality of our time. May we who have no risk factors remember those who are most vulnerable. May we who have the luxury to work from home remember those who must choose between preserving their health or making their rent. God, may we who are losing our margin money in the, in the midst of this economic market remember those who have no margin at all. May we who settle in for a quarantine at home remember those who have no home to go to. During this time when we cannot physically gather or physically wrap our hands around one another, help us remember that we can live in the midst of both and. We can grieve all that has been lost and give thanks for all that we still have. We can grieve that which we miss, and we can also remember how fortunate we are. Regardless of what we do, help us not guilt or shame one another for what we feel and experience, but instead, let us yet find ways to be the loving embrace of you, our God, to our neighbors. In the midst of all that we are, we give thanks to you, our steady rock and our everlasting redeemer. So let us give thanks now by saying together the prayer Christ taught his disciples, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. We have two scripture readings today. I'm going to read the first one, and then my cameraman is going to read our second one. So our first scripture reading today comes from Exodus chapter 23, verses 1 through 13. You shall not spread a false report. You shall not join hands with the wicked to act as a malicious witness. You shall not follow a majority in wrongdoing when you bear witness in a lawsuit. 
You shall not side with the majority so as to pervert justice, nor shall you be partial to the poor in a lawsuit. When you come upon your enemy's ox or donkey going astray, you shall bring it back. When you see the donkey of one who hates you lying under its burden and you would hold back from setting it free, you must help to set it free. You shall not pervert the justice due to your poor in their lawsuits. Keep far from a false charge and do not kill the innocent and those in the right, for I will not acquit the guilty. You shall take no bribe, for a bribe blinds the officials and subverts the cause of those who are right. You shall not oppress a resident alien. You know the heart of an alien, for you were aliens in the land of Egypt. For six years you shall sow your land and gather in its yield, but the seventh year you shall let it rest and lie fallow, so that the poor of your people may eat and what they leave the wild animals may eat. You shall do the same with your vineyard and with your olive orchard. Six days you shall do your work, but on the seventh day you shall rest, so that your ox and your donkey may have relief, and your home-born slave and the resident alien may be refreshed. Be attentive to all that I have said to you. Do not invoke the name of other gods. Do not let them be heard on your lips. The second reading comes from Levit Leviticus chapter 25, verses 1 through 18. Uh, the Lord spoke to Moses on Mount Sinai, saying, Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, When you enter the land that I am giving you, the land shall observe a Sabbath for the Lord. Six years you shall sow your field, and six years you shall prune your vineyard and gather in their yield. But in the seventh year there shall be a Sabbath of complete rest for the land, a Sabbath for the Lord. You shall not sow your field or prune your vineyard. You shall not reap the aftergrowth or, of, or your harvest or gather the grapes of your unpruned vine. It shall be a year of complete rest for the land. You may eat the land, what the land yields during its Sabbath. You, your male and female slaves, your hired and your bound laborers who live with you. For your livestock also, and the wild animals in your land, and all its yield shall be for food. You shall count off seven weeks of years, seven times seven years, so that the period of seven weeks of, se of years gives forty-nine years. Then you shall have the trumpet sounded loud. On the tenth day of the seventh month, on the day of atonement, you shall have the trumpet sounded throughout all your land. And you shall hallow the fiftieth year, and you shall proclaim liberty, liberty throughout the land to all its inhabitants. It shall be jubilee for you. You shall return every one of you to your property and every one of you to your family. That fiftieth year shall be a jubilee for you. You shall not sow or reap after growth or harvest the unpruned vines. For it is a jubilee. You sh it shall be holy to you. You shall eat only what the field itself produces. In the year of Jubilee, you shall return every one of you to your own property. When you make a sale to your neighbor or buy from your neighbor, you shall not cheat one another. When you buy from your neighbor, you shall pay for only the number of years since the Jubilee. The seller shall charge you only for the remaining crop years. If the years are more, you shall increase the price. If the years are fewer, you shall diminish the price. For it is a certain number of harvests that are being sold to you. You shall not cheat one another, but for but shall fear your God, for I am the Lord your God. You shall observe my statuses and faithfully keep my ordinances, so that you may live on the land securely. The land will yield its fruit, and you will eat your fill and live on it securely. Should you ask, what shall we eat in the seventh year, if we may not sow or gather in our crop? I will order my blessing for you in the sixth year, so that it will yield a crop in the, for three years. When you sow in the eighth year, you will be eating from the old crop until the ninth year. When in its produce comes in, you shall eat the old. The land shall not be sold in perpetuity, for the land is mine. With me, you are but aliens and tenants. Throughout the land that you hold, you shall provide for the redemption of the land. If any one of your kin falls into difficulty and sells a piece of property, then the next of kin shall come and redeem what the relative has sold. If the person has no one to redeem it, but then prospers and finds sufficient means to do so, 
The year since its sale shall be computed, and the difference shall be refunded to the person whom it was sold. And the property shall be returned. But if there is not sufficient means to recover it, what was sold shall remain with the purchaser until the year of Jubilee. And the Jubilee it shall be released, and the property shall be returned. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. All praise to the living word. Will you join me in a moment of prayer? God, in your grace, transform this world. We give you thanks for your blessings and signs of hope that are already present in our midst, in people of all ages and in those who have gone before us in faith, in those working together for justice and peace, in the deep and open dialogues that have just begun. God, we are grateful for the gifts of your creation in the waters and in the air, in the land and in all living things. We find you. Help us find you today in the gifts of your creation and in the gift of rest. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. On March 23rd of this year, New York City went into a complete lockdown in order to prevent the continued spread of the coronavirus. What nearly no one expected from this total lockdown was the effect of their actions, or lack thereof, on the environment. Due to the lockdown, New York City traffic levels have decreased by 35% from what they were in 2019, and they have already experienced a decrease in emissions of carbon monoxide by 50%. On March 9th, Italy, which has been battling the second biggest coronavirus outbreak, went on lockdown and they found similar effects on their environment as Milan experienced nitrogen oxide levels fall by nearly 40%. Citizens of Venice have reported the miraculous sightings of new fish, the returning of swans, and even dolphins swimming upon the clearer waters of the canals that are usually filled with boats. One Italian man reported, Boars in the middle of my hometown, dolphins in the ports of Cagliari, ducks in the fountains in Rome, Venice canals have now clean water full of fishes, air pollution dropped, nature is reclaiming its spaces during quarantine in Italy. Scientists argue that our efforts of human hibernation have not only helped us protect ourselves, but they are also protecting our planet. With less places to be, little driving to and from work, rarely any air travel, and a slowing down of our regular economic frenzied pace, Actions of social distancing around the world have not only prevented some of us from getting the virus, but we've also inevitably given the earth a chance to slow down, a chance for rest. Mother Nature is taking a short breath of fresh air, uninterrupted by the world's incessant need to travel, produce, and work. For decades, and perhaps centuries, our economy has not given the earth a chance to rest, a chance to breathe. The pandemic is nothing to celebrate, yet it has led us to act in ways that slow down the harm we and our lifestyles have caused for centuries. While God illustrated rest for us, and while God commanded that we rest, God also commanded the land to rest. In our modern worldviews, the notion of the land resting seems foreign. Systems of our economy focused on production have led us to believe the earth ought to be used solely for our purposes, rather than seeing ourselves in relationship to the earth, or believing that we may need the earth as it also needs us. Our texts from Exodus and Leviticus today illustrate how the mindset of Israelites differed dramatically from ours relating to their relationship to the land. The land was not a commodity to the Israelites, 
but it was a living, breathing character with which they had a relationship to. We can find clues to this relationship between the land and the Israelites in the language used and how the land is described throughout Scripture. In just the text surrounding our scripture today, the land is described with characteristics like that of a person. Leviticus chapter 25 sits within this larger narrative known as the Holiness Code, and it spans from Leviticus chapter 17 to chapter 26. The Holiness Code further describes ethical practices given from God to the Israelites based on the law. The law then helps the Israelites live in harmony within their relationships to God and their relationships with others. In this holiness code alone, in just these 10 chapters of Leviticus, the land is often described as the subject of a verb, as the land acts something out as if it was its own character in the story. Throughout the holiness code, the land is defiled, the land spits out she takes pleasure and she eats. She gives and she rests. The land is not passive in this text. It's an active character in the narrative that we read from scripture today. And our text upholds the agency of this land, illustrating how the land, like humans, deserves care, compassion, and rest. The land, like humans and God, is its own character, and it does not submit to humans for their productivity, but instead the land is in relationship with God and with humans. In addition to the land's agency as a separate character, the Israelites were also commanded to give the land a year of rest every seventh year. Like our need for rest, God commands the Israelites to recognize the land's need also for rest. In Exodus chapter 23, we find this commandment to give the land the rest it needs and deserves. Some modern readers may assume that this commandment is yet another antiquated suggestion to ignore, yet surrounding the commandment for the land to find rest are other commandments concerning relationships such as giving one's ox and donkey rest every seventh day, giving the workers and slaves rest on the Sabbath, and other commandments not concerned with Sabbath, but still concerned with relationships, including a commandment to not receive bribes during trials, an order to not oppress refugees or treat them poorly, for they are running for their lives, just as the Israelites were once refugees fleeing from violence. There's also a commandment to not steal or leave a stray animal, even if one knows that the animal belongs to one's enemy. The commandment appears to always return the animal, and there are more. Each one of these rules provides guidance to the Israelites about how to exist in relationship to others in compassionate, justice-abiding, and God-centered ways. And the Israelites' relationship to the land is no exception. We all need rest to survive and to stay in healthy relationships with one another and with God. The land deserves rest just like the Israelites do. The animals and servants deserve rest just like the land does, and so on. Leviticus chapter 25 further expresses what Exodus 23 explains as the land's need for rest and the implications of the land's resting period and what that means for the Israelites. Additionally, our text from Leviticus today further explains a celebration centered around the year of rest for the land that happens every 50 years, and that celebration is known as the Jubilee Year. During the Jubilee year, relationships are restored. Relationships between the people and God, people with one another, and people with the land and other creatures. Debts are forgiven and restored. Borrowed land or animals are returned. Like the land Sabbath that happens every seven years, the Jubilee year is also treated as a Sabbath year for the land and only the crop that is cultivated naturally can be used as food. During the Jubilee year, people return to their properties. All slaves are instructed to be set free and return to their families 
and so forth. The Jubilee was meant to be a celebration of liberation, and this celebration reminds us as readers that all relationships are restored, including the relationship between the people and their land. The Jubilee not only provides rest and restoration for all relationships, but the celebration also reminds the Israelites that they are not owners of the land or owners of one another. But instead, everything belongs to God. In the Jubilee, when items are returned, debts are forgiven, and when we treat the land with respect by allowing it time for rest, we are acting as ambassadors of God rather than pretending that we are God. Jubilee provides the Israelites with the opportunity to restore their relationships for the purposes of remembering who their ultimate creator and liberator is. I wonder how our current efforts of physical distancing can help us begin to implement some form of Sabbath for the land. Without consciously choosing to do so, we have provided the earth with a chance to breathe deep for the first time in a long time. The celebration of the Jubilee and the commandment to offer the land rest every seventh year is a rest that the earth desperately needs and our world has begun to witness the positive consequences for the land and its creature, creatures when it takes time for rest. One issue for us centers around the idea that we have lost this sense of relationality with the earth. We have belittled and manipulated the earth, its vegetation, the trees, our animals, and we've treated them as if they were created solely for our own purposes of nourishment, production, and for our impossibly fast-paced fast lifestyles. However, our texts from Leviticus and Exodus remind us how God and our ancestors took seriously their relationship to the earth. In their actions that prov provided rest for the land, they illustrate how it is not just that trees can give us oxygen and we go on our way, but that we have a relationship to the earth that is interdependent. As we breathe in the oxygen given from the trees, we breathe out carbon dioxide. Trees then take in the carbon dioxide and release the oxygen into the atmosphere. Our relationship to the trees and the land is interdependent, and it is essential that we not only remember our interdependency, but that we maintain our relationship with care, compassion, and grace in the same, same way that we ought to with any relationship. And sometimes this care, compassion, and grace comes in the form of offering space for rest. In his book, Consolations, the Solace, Nourishment, and Underlying Meaning of Everyday Words, David White defines rest, saying that to rest is not self-indulgent. To rest is to prepare to give the best of ourselves and to perhaps most importantly arrive at a place where we are all able to understand what we have already been given. White's definition works well for humans, recognizing that our need for rest is not a selfish need, but is instead what helps us reach out better to each other. But his definition also applies to the restful work of the land. The land produces, nourishes, and supplies more graciously and freely after given time for rest. When we constantly use and overuse the resources of the land, its resources run out faster and eventually we deplete the earth of her natural resources. Our mindsets change from seeing the earth as a commodity and instead as a being with with which we are in relationship with. The earth and the land were not built solely for us, but we were created from the dust of this land. The land, just like our God, who is our ultimate parent, is a part of our DNA. We receive life in part due to the resources of the land of the earth and it is time that we not only give thanks for this gift but that we also allow her space and time for rest. 
We are being called to change how we perceive ourselves in relationship to the land. Like the faithful Israelites, we must see ourselves in relationship to the land. Not because we are in control of the land, but instead we must see the land as a gift to us from God. In our physical distancing efforts of staying home, halting travel, spending more time outdoors, being in awe of, this, of the miraculous changes that emerge in spring, we can offer space to the land for rest. We may not fix all of the issues, and in fact, the more we stay home, the more energy we use compared to the energy we used when many of us left for work. But nonetheless, our lack of air travel has wiped clean the pollution of large cities and it has cleared skies around the world that people had not seen for months, if not years. In the midst of less sea travel, countries like Italy have reinvited spaces for land and sea creatures to reemerge and to exist among the canals. And while we are at home, we can take part in individual ways to support the rest our land and non-human creatures need, including opening our windows for fresh air while turning off our heat or air to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions used by our AC and heating systems. We can switch to paperless billing to reduce the use of paper. We can spend less time on our computers, our phones, our tablets, and more, and spend more time outdoors to reduce the energy that we use. We can commit to recycle and reuse what we can, particularly plastic items, as to reduce the amount of plastic that, is, that we produce and even our own rest will give rest to the earth as we spend time laying in the grass, as we spend time slowly and intentionally breathing deep to allow our lungs to fill with the oxygen of the trees as we return the gift back to them with our carbon dioxide. Who says Earth Day has to be over? Let us make this time of rest for ourselves and for the Earth. Let it be a celebration of God's good creation with which we have the responsibility to care for compassionately and gracefully. On this year of the 50th year of celebrating Earth Day, let us give thanks to our Creator God and to this Earth. Let us give thanks by offering the opportunity of what the earth is in most desperate need of in our current time, by offering the gift of rest. May it be so. Amen. As we spend time uh, apart physically, we still are asking folks to keep the church in their prayers and to um, also think of supporting us financially, you can do so by sending in your gifts to the church. Our P.O. box will appear on the screen and you can also find that address on our website. You can also give to us on our online giving page and you can find a link to that giving page from our website. We also are asking folks that if you have extra to give, um, there are some families and people who have extra to give when they receive stimulus checks. And so we ask that folks um, keep in mind that we would like to support Caring Hands Food Pantry. It's a food pantry here in Altoona that we often support with our regular donations of food. Um, they would prefer that we offer right now through financial gifts. So if you would like to give to Caring Hands, we suggest that you send your gifts to the church and please indicate either on your check or with a note in the envelope that you um, would like to support Caring Hands through that gift. We'll then deposit those gifts and send the food pantry a check probably once a month so that they're not bombarded with multiple checks. And that way your giving can show up on your, um, your quarterly giving statement from the church as well. So Please keep caring hands in all food pantries in our community and around the world in your prayers. They have more needs now than they used to, and so we would like to just continue to support them. And that's how you can offer um, your gifts to God this week is by um, sending those gifts to the church. So 
in a few moments, um, I would like you to join with me in a community prayer. But before we do that, here's another hymn from um, Evan, Allison, Eric, and Linda. And so I invite you to sing along with them and then come back for a community prayer. and saying aloud this community prayer. It's a prayer that we are going to say together as a way to internalize more um, this reflection of rest, rest for ourselves and rest for the earth. And it's also an, a prayer that we can use as our offering prayer today as a way for praying for all that we do and seeing that all that we do is an offering to God. So will you join me now in this prayer, saying this prayer aloud? Creator God, may we always walk gently upon the earth in right relationship, nurtured by your love, open to the wind of the Spirit, taking only what we need, always open to the needs of others, making choices that bring well-being, living with generosity, striving for justice, reconciling and peacemaking mindful of those who will come after and recognizing our proper place as part of your creation. Grant us the strength and courage, Lord, for such a radical transformation into your kingdom. Amen. Friends, as you go forth from this time of worship, may you go forth with this blessing and this benediction. And after I give you this benediction, please stick around to sing with Allison and Linda. Um, God be with you till we meet again. So receive now this blessing. May the peace of God, the grace of Jesus Christ, and the power of the Holy Spirit be with you until we gather again. May you go forth finding rest in the joys that you receive from the beautiful creation of God. And may you find space this week to offer that same rest back to the earth. Amen. Go in peace. I'll see you soon. Bye-bye.